Hello, and welcome back to The Grunt Perspective. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking about how to prep your gear for amphibious operations. Uh, before I start, we'll say um, I'm fucking dog sick right now. Um, so if I sound weird or if I have to cough at some point during the video, I apologize, uh, but yeah. Um, so this is the second time I try to film this video. The first time I tried, I uh, wasn't really happy with it. I feel like I left some important stuff out um, and I just feel like it wasn't done very well. So I'm gonna go again, I'm giving it another shot here. If you've been watching my videos, you know that I do it all in one take. And if I forget about to say something then I basically have to restart. So yeah, that's where we're at. Um, now, getting your gear prepped for amphibious operations. Uh, this is basically, only going to apply to the Marines that watch this video. Um, it could apply to you if you're someone that um, maybe you use a boat pretty frequently and you plan on using a boat to get from wherever you are to your next position, you know, world ends type scenario, like I'm going to bug out, use my boat, right? Uh, this could also be very applicable for you because if something does go wrong on that said boat, then um, and your gear's not ready, then you're going to lose it all. Uh, now, um, the way that I have this gear prepped here is, uh, I think it's important to note that this is extremely different than a preparation that someone would do if they were like doing an amphibious assault. Like, you know, like the movies, right? As soon as I get out of the vehicle, I'm fighting immediately as soon as I hit the beach. Um, this is not that this is meant for a more clandestine insert uh very little to no opposition on the uh, beach landing zone and basically we're just trying to get on the damn island so we can start operations um now swimming with your gear is a skill that the marine corps as a whole has not done in combat for a long time. Um, it was never really a heavily practiced skill amongst the large forces. It was basically only recon Marines and scout swimmers and boat companies and things like that. Uh, but with the way that the Marine Corps is going now, um, this is a skill that you might need to know. Um, so with all the, with all the disclaimers out, out of the way, start talking about some common trends that I see a lot when it comes to uh, amphibious operations and some things to avoid. Hmm. So, number one uh, is gonna be tie downs. Uh, you should think of amphibious operations the same way that paratroopers think about airborne operations. You know, like before paratroopers jump, there's a very deliberate inspection that takes place of their, obviously their parachute and all their, that equipment, but their personal gear, um, they have all kinds of stuff tied down because if they were to lose something, then that would mean that it would just be falling and it could potentially hit someone who is below them. Um, now, while we don't have to worry about hitting someone that is below us, um, you should think of the ocean the same way. It will steal everything from you that is not tied down, basically. Um, as soon as people get in the water, they, uh, you see stuff starting to float away, stuff not secured properly. Uh, so a big thing is gonna be tie downs. Uh, you need to make sure that all of your equipment um, that is, well, I mean, really, it should just be all of your equipment is tied down and properly secured and fastened within your rucksack or on the outside of your rucksack. So, <coughs> excuse me, for example here, these two quart canteens, while they are inside a pouch, I have since removed it because I just used this pack all week. But before I got in the water, I had a slip knot tied around the neck of the canteen tied to the inside of the pack on the side right there. Um, they, the, like the two quart canteen pouches have never failed me. Uh, they've never failed me before, but those, that little plastic is known to be a little bit brittle. And obviously if that two quart canteen is full of water, then where's it going straight down. Right. And I'm not going to have that, uh, that, that water. Um, 
So properly secured your tie downs and thing and things like that, your whole gear, just like I said, you should you there's a lot of similarities between this and airborne operations because the you know 200 mile an hour winds will steal everything from you and so will so will the water especially if you're in a surf zone you're getting beat up with waves as like you're trying to take your fins off or something like that um you need to make sure that all your stuff is going to be secured nice and tight and even if it does come out of its designated pouch you're not going to lose it um Next big mistake is going to be waterproofing. Uh, just in general, like there is a there is a very large difference between something being weatherproof and something being waterproof, right? If I were to want to weatherproof something, then I could get away with using one of these little bags here, these kind of fabric on the inside. They have kind of like a like a PVC coating. And that's going to do just fine to keep out rain uh, and to keep out, you know, maybe quick sub submersions of your gear, right? But um, waterproof means that there, there absolutely has to be no way for water to ingress into your pack. Your gear is, a, is your flotation device, right? Everyone knows that, that, that Marines can swim. Everyone that's in the Marine Corps knows that that is, I'm going to say it's 100% true of every single Marine that's in the Marine Corps. Yeah. So um, your gear is a flotation device, right? And it's going to keep you alive. It's going to keep you, you know, above the water when you're going through rough patches of surf and things like that. Uh, but it's also everything that you need to fight for the next however long you're going to be there. So you need to make sure that your waterproofing is impenetrable, right? And I'll show you how I achieve that in a, in a, a little bit here. <clears throat> uh, third thing that I see commonly is the lack of a tether to your gear. Uh, you're going to want to tether. You can see the bottom of my pack here. Side note, I think this is the first time my Malice pack has been on the channel. Kind of blows my mind because this is the pack I use for 90% of stuff. But yes, this is a Gen 2 Malice pack, which I use for most things. Um, a tether. I usually run, 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 run my tether around my frame. And then I use a locking carabiner, which is going to tether my pack to my uh, riggers belt. <laughs> now, uh, based on the type of cordage that you're going to use, you know, like nylon webbing or like the scuba webbing stuff, the tubular nylon is going to work very well for something like this. You can always use 550 cord. I would caution you if you're going to use five, 550 cord, make sure that you're tying proper knots with safeties because the water does tend to loosen up these knots just a little bit. That being said, I've never had a problem with it, but every time I come out of the water, I do notice that my knots are a little bit loose. Um, so you need to tether your gear to, to, to yourself, right? For all the same reasons that I've just talked about. You know, it's your flotation device. If I get freaking dumped hard by the surf, I can always reach down to my belt, follow the line up to my pack. Or if my pack gets stuck in something, I can find my pack, right? But I'm sure that you're thinking of some potential problems here with having stuff tied to you when you're in the water. And uh, that is the probability that it could get stuck on something. Uh, so, you need to, so you need to make sure that when you tie this tether, you, you can see that mine is relatively short. There's not a lot of slack in it when I'm pushing my pack. You can choose to push or pull, or, or pull your pack. I personally like to push mine. But whatever you do, you need to make sure that there's not going to be a lot of slack here. Because they can get stuck on things like, you know, coral, old fishing net, lines, hooks, things like that. Um, and then that's going to become very dangerous for you. So on the same side of the coin as a tether is a knife. Um, this is a dive knife. I don't know. I think Aqualung, right, um, that I just hit with some paint. And you can see that I got a bunch of 550, again, to tether. Um, <clears throat> excuse me so 
You could either choose to wear this on your calf, on your forearm or something like that, but it's important that you have a knife and it shouldn't be a knife that has any sort of friction sheath, any sort of pocket clip. That's not going to cut it for you. You're probably going to lose that. So this has a, a hard detent sheath to pull this knife out. I have to squeeze on both sides here and then I can pull the knife out. I can start to cut, cut myself free like that. Right. Um, but for all the same, but because your pack is going to be tethered to you, right? It's important to have some way to cut that tether. Uh, if you get into a situation where you need to do so, if your pack is drowning you, if your waterproofing fails for whatever reason, and now your pack is dragging you down, you're going to have to cut it. It's, it, it's either, you know, you try to get to the shore with all of your gear <clears throat> and maybe drown or you let it go and you survive off of off of your friends right you always there's always room in the sleeping bag for one more right um so something to have same thing as as uh the as uh, the tether here all this additional line i usually run this up to my belt uh and when i'm not using it i fold it all up here nice and tight like this and then i just get a rubber band and i uh secure the rest of that stuff so it's nice and tight very minimal um, amount of loose line but when i pull the knife out it all comes undone and i can use it uh, something that works really well for dive knives uh, is one of those like retractable key lanyards those those work great because you can physically like attach them to the sheath or attach them very close to the knife wherever you have it uh, attached at and you pull it out you do your thing and then it's going to retract it back near where the sheath is and then from there you can insert it into the sheath plus because it's retractable it's also going to keep the slack in that line very taut and it's going to make it very unlikely that that is going to get stuck on stuff so have a tether and have some way to cut the tether um next would be not having additional waterproofing supplies so you you get your pack ready right and then inevitably like i always talk about on the channel there's some additional piece of equipment that is going to get given to you right before you're getting ready to, to get off the ship or to do whatever you're doing right so you need to have some additional stuff with you and the way that i usually achieve that is just uh five to ten extra ziploc bags here um just stuffed inside of one of my pouches that I can use to waterproof things like radios, ammunition, if necessary, um, any other kind of stuff. Right. But usually, uh, well, I, I'm, I'll, I'll get into that in, in a, in a second here, but you need to have extra stuff, right? Uh, you're always going to get kind of get given something that you didn't expect to carry. Maybe a dagger, maybe a pop flare, maybe <clears throat> extra radio batteries like 2590s or something like that and all that stuff needs to needs to be safe and it needs to make it to the beach with you right so always have some extra bags uh, i usually do e either the one gallon ziploc bags or i've found a few before the two and a half gallon ziploc bags which i like those quite a bit uh, they're just kind of hard to find um, on the subject of Ziploc bags, I always opt for the ones that have uh, like the zipper, well, not the zipper, like the press and lock type closure, not the zipper type. Because with the zipper type, it, even if you get it all the way to the end, there's still a little bit of open space there that water could come in through. So I always use, use these ones when I'm doing like waterproof versus like weatherproofing. Um, but yeah, Ziploc bags. Uh, next, sharp edges, right? So I've left a couple things out here so I could show some potential problems when you're waterproofing your gear, right? You need to pay very close attention to every single thing that you waterproof, right? Especially in your main compartment here, which I'll get to. But your anything sharp, 
or potentially could puncture that bag, right? So some common things, right? Speed loaders. Lots of Marines and lots of soldiers like to put speed loaders on the bands on their on their uh, helmets. It's a good it it's a good place to keep them. They're out of the way and things like that, right? But this has sharp edges on it, and this this could potentially puncture or tear your waterproofing uh, apparatus, be it whatever you ch you uh, choose to do, right? Speed loaders, things like rank insignia. If you have a well. I mean, the Army has the so on rank insignia, but the Marine Corps still uses the pin on like metal ones. So uh, make sure that if you have an extra uniform or maybe you have a Gore-Tex top or something like that, make sure that you do not have rank insignia on that on that on that Gore-Tex on that on that uniform, be it whatever it is, because that little pointy edge there could potentially pop your bag. So I know it's going to piss off your uh your first aren't right, but like you need to do what you need to do to make sure that you're that you that you're going to be okay, right? So rank insignia, speed loaders. If I go to my helmet here. My helmet's full of all kinds of pointy spots and sharp edges here. So I'm gonna put this down so you can. Oh, I just moved my whole fucking table. All right, right. My uh, my rhino mount here. This could potentially be a problem. So. I usually take this off. I stow it inside of like my fanny pack or something like that, which I usually keep inside of my helmet there to make sure that, that there's no sharp edges that could potentially pop my bag. On the back of my helmet here, I have some zip ties, which I've used uh, to, route, to route my cables. I literally filed these down with a Leatherman to make sure that they're not sharp enough to pop that bag. Same thing on this side, right? Pay special uh, attention to sharp edges and things like that. And if there's something that you have to pack that has sharp sh sharp spots and you can't get around like not packing it or not bringing it, then <coughs> what you could do is you could wrap that piece of equipment up in some sort of other piece of equipment, right? So when I put this, even though I took all the considerations to make this safe, I still wrap my whole helmet up inside of my Gore-Tex top and then put my Gore-Tex top in or and, and then put my helmet inside of my Gore-Tex top inside of my pack to make sure that that there's no possible way that it could puncture that bag. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so sharp edges, pay, pay special attention to all that stuff. But before you put it inside your pack, examine it thoroughly and make sure that, that there's nothing that could potentially pop that bag. <clears throat> now, the, now the last one would be empty, empty water sources, right? Um, like Marines in training, they, uh, they, maybe if they don't feel too confident about their waterproofing, they'll empty their water sources to give that additional air to provide more buoyancy, right? Um, I shouldn't have to explain why that's bad because, you know, obviously you're not going to do that in real life. So if your pack can't float with all of your water sources full, which there's no which there's no reason why it shouldn't, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight liters of water in my pack full, and my pack floats every single time. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't float, but uh, guys still tend to get nervous with it. It's going to be fine if you do it right. You need to go and hit the objective with your water full because if you don't, then where are you going to get it? Is it there? Do we know? Do we not know? I don't know, right? But that's just a really bad habit to get yourself into uh, is hitting an objective without water. Um, so with all that kind of, mm, excuse me. Now with all that kind of, bad stuff out of the way here, start talking about how I actually waterproof my pack and make it float. Um, a lot of people really don't care for when I get behind the camera and talk for 10 minutes. Um, they're like, just show us the fucking gear. Like that's half, that's literally half of the point, right? Uh, if you don't care about me talking, then this channel is probably not for you. All right. So now when you waterproof your gear, it's all about achieving the maximum amount of buoyancy possible. 
So you're going to want to waterproof stuff that does not inherently need to be waterproofed, right? So an example of this, unclip my pack here. An example of this would be your tarp, right? So up in the top of my pack here, I have my tarp that is stuffed inside of two Ziploc bags. And I always double bag for uh, my Ziploc bags because, you know, they're a little bit brittle, but two is better than one. And, you know, I've had one of these fail before. So, but I also don't want to bag it like four or five times. So two is a pretty safe bet. If it's something that you really are concerned about, then you could do three or four or maybe something like that. If it's like a radio or ammunition or something like that. Um, that reminds me for things with sharp edges, like I talked about with the helmet there, um, put it inside of something else, something else that you could do like a one, five, two radio, put it inside a boot sock, get that extra end of the boot sock up on the top where all the connections are. Cause that's usually the spot that's going to tear the bag and then put it inside a two or three bags like that. And that'll usually help, help you out for that. And then your antennas and stuff. So yeah, uh, you're, you're trying to achieve the maximum amount of buoyancy possible. So stuff that does not inherently need to be waterproofed, you should waterproof like your tarp. Um, snacks are another good example, right? So like here, I'll just keep going here. iPro, you know, does not, it's not going to be affected by water, but you know, it's got some air inside there. So I'm going to double bag it. Um, Snacks and things like that, right? I just went to the field with this pack, so you guys are probably like, wow, this dude's dirty as fuck, but I just came back. Uh, so, uh, you know, you got the wrappers, which inherently are waterproof, but I'm still going to put them inside of two bags to maintain maximum amount of buoyancy there. Um, here's all my extra bags. Pull those off and set them to the side there. Batteries, you should always waterproof. Those are obviously double bags. Um, Field craft kit, there's nothing inside here that's going to be damaged by it getting wet. But just like I've been saying, maximum amount of buoyancy. Hygiene gear inside of these, inside of these, these, these two pockets. Uh, again, it'd be double bagged up. Um, right here, I got some quick warming layers. Uh, again, they're double bagged. I'm not going to take them out. And then here I have two uh, water bottles that I got from uh, Venture Surplus. They're uh, the Forest Service canteens which work pretty cool, by the way. Um, now, getting into your main compartment. This is uh, your bread and butter here. So the way that I like to do this is contractor trash bags. So these big old trash bags, <coughs> excuse me, the way that I, or the reason why that I like contractor bags is because one, they're large enough to fit like the full volume of the pack and two they're much thicker than normal trash bags these ones specifically are, are like four mil thick and they go all the way up to like seven or eight mil um and i always do two of them so i just brought one to show out here but i have two of them inside of my backpack one inside of the other here and then this is where the vast majority of all of my equipment goes or all of your equipment would go for whatever the fuck you're doing, all right? So I'm not gonna unpack it all because, you know, but inside I've got chow, uh, my sleeping bag, some warming layers, I have my plate carrier um, and some socks and underwear and things like that, right? But the important thing here is how you close it. So you make sure that you have both bags. You can see that I have both bags here. Pull them up real tight, grab them down low and then you're gonna twist this as tight as you can possibly twist it, right? So you can see, I got that thing that's twisted up there very well. Now, on the very end here, I put one zip tie as tight as possible. I got some zip ties down there, but I put one zip tie there as tight as possible. Something important to note about the zip ties, especially on the inner portion here, once I put that on, I do not trim the zip ties because I don't want to create that sharp edge when you cut a zip tie. So I just leave the whole zip tie there, zip tie there, and then I fold it over 
So I got that little knot right there. And then I zip tie again as tight as possible. Don't trim it. All right. Now that has always worked for me. Uh, I guess theoretically it could seep water, but I've never done it before. I've been in the water for probably close to an hour uh, to two hours with it with the zip ties like that. I've never I've never had problems with buoyancy, and I've never had water inside of my pack when I open it up. Uh, so that's where you're going to get the majority of your buoyancy there, right? This 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 com this compartment of your pack should 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 contain all of your larger items. You're basically gonna pack your pack just like you normally would, right? Make sure that there's nothing inside this main compartment that you're gonna need immediately as soon as you get off the beach or get on the beach, right? So, I don't know, maybe a radio or something like that, like as soon as you establish uh, the, the BLZ, uh, then you're gonna need to get your radio out and call to other people, right? Maybe that should be in, in, inside an exterior pocket on the outside of your pack, right? Um, but yes, so pack your pack just like normal with some special consideration taken to things that you're gonna need immediately. Uh, but that's how I've always done it. I've done, I've done it exactly like this three or four times now, and I've never had problems with it. So it's works. It's worked for me. It's going to work for you too. Uh, just like I, just like I've been saying here, just pay special attention to sharp edges and things like that. Um, so I think I pretty much hit everything that I need to hit. Oh, one, one, one more thing here. Uh, your MREs, right? I got, I got one on the outside here cause I just got back from the field, but, uh, if you choose not to field strip them, they come in a vacuum sealed package, right? So if you maybe don't have room or you don't want to do it exactly like this, just don't field strip them and they're going to float. If you take a full unopened MRE and you drop it in a bucket of water, it's going to float. So that's another way to, to uh, achieve that. But yes, so I believe I've covered it all here to kind of recap. Uh, make sure you have good tie downs. Make sure your waterproofing is not weatherproofing, it's waterproofing. Uh, make sure you tether your pack on the other side. Make sure you have a knife to cut that tether if you need to. Have some extra bags. Uh, pay attention to sharp edges and hit the beach with your fucking waterfall. God damn it. Cool? All right. Well, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys again next time.